um, welcome everybody to another Wednesday webinar. Uh, my name is Wendy Fracchia. I am the operations manager for Morris Murdoch Escorted Tours, and we're excited that you found our video today. We love to share information about some of our wonderful tours. We think that anytime we can get um, our directors in front of you and let them explain their tours is always the best selling experience. And our directors have so much wonderful information. So we're really excited today to actually have Jeremy Holmes with us. And Jeremy's got so many interest and we've always known him as the Olympic bobsledder, but he's become an amazing researcher and um, author on World War II, and it's for very personal reasons. So I'm going to let Jeremy take uh, a minute and introduce himself to you and some of the wonderful projects he's been involved in, and then he's going to tell you about a special D-Day tour that we actually have next year that is going to commemorate a very special anniversary. So Jeremy, thank you for being with us for a little bit today. And hey, thanks, Wendy. Yeah, it's I mean, gosh, how long have we known each other now? I was trying to figure that out the other day and it's been it's was it like been, 15 years or you know what? Think. You don't look like I've known you more than, <laughs> than 10. So <laughs> you're right. I, I was I was very green back from a mission for for the LDS church and so forth. So, so I am really excited to be here with everyone today. And and like Wendy said, thanks for uh, listening to this video. And, you know, we're excited to share it through all of our social media and our e-blast and so forth. Um, this is going to be a fantastic tour. And and just, I'm really excited. D-Day, the 80th anniversary next year. I mean, this is going to be incredible. And, and we'll get into the itinerary in just a second. But yeah, I probably should tell you a little bit about myself for those who don't know me. I am actually, my background is in bobsled. I started when I was in high school. Um, one day my dad came to me and said like, you know, would you like to try bobsledding? And I said, sure. And it's funny cause I grew up, you know, hating roller coasters. And, you know, I, I went up there and just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So I, I was a pilot. Would have never guess. I know, right? That's what everybody says. Like, wow, you didn't like roller coasters. And, and the problem is bobsled ruins roller coasters for you. So you know, after you get into it for a while, you go to like Six Flags or like we talked about Silver Dollar City and, and you ride the roller coasters and you're like, yeah, this is great. But, you know, in those you have a, you know, seatbelt and computer controlled and all that stuff. And Bob said you have none of that stuff. So so in these photos, I'm actually the the driver, the one up front right there. So I drove two and four man Bob sled for a while. Um, just loved it. Thought it was fantastic. And then I was the head coach for the U.S. adaptive Bob sled team for a while. So that's working with amputees and paraplegics and so forth. So we were helping to develop the sport for uh, the Paralympics. So you'll see that in the future and stuff. So yeah, I mean, like like you said, my background's very odd. I mean, even before Bob said I was doing drag racing. So throw that into the mix. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a little a bit of life. a thrill seeker. <laughs> yeah, which is funny because I really wasn't, um, you know, growing up, I was kind of the, the nerdy kid. I loved to read. Um, I was the quiet one in class, didn't cause any trouble or anything. And then, you know, next thing I know, I'm throwing myself down a mountain at 90 uh -huh. miles an hour wearing spandex and a helmet, you know, and, and just, I loved it. it. It's such a great sport. So, you know, it, it's funny because a lot of people ask if Cool Runnings is my favorite movie and it's not my favorite. It's, it's cool. It's like 2% true, but great movie at least shows you what our sport is like. And yeah, so super fun. So drag racing, bobsled. And, uh, and like you said, I, I actually have a very personal connection um, with World War II history. And yeah, like how, how did the direction go with that? Like what, what really started that passion for you? Well, so I, I grew up and, you know, I have, you know, I, I both sets of grandparents were amazing. Um, we spent a little bit more time with my mom's parents. Just we'd go visit them on the East Coast. They live in Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. And we go to the beach with them all the time and we'd ride bikes around the golf course. And, you know, my grandpa taught me to swim and, and all these different things. Like, you know, I can, I have these vivid memories with my grandfather growing up and everything. And, and one thing that always stood out to me as a kid was, well, grandpa doesn't have a ring finger on his right hand. And then at the beach and in the pool, you know, I noticed he had um, a big scar and a big 
hole really in his shoulder and everything. And, and as a kid, you see it, you don't really realize that. Yeah. It wasn't until I got older that I realized he almost died in World War II. He was a paratrooper um, who was shot um, by actually a Japanese machine gunner and almost died on a hilltop outside of Manila, Luzon, trying to liberate that island. So as I got older and as I came to really appreciate what he did and what World War II is really about, you know, you kind of start getting that recognition in high he school. I much more of a of a hero as well. It was like this 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 grandfather, and now you see him also as a hero in a different aspect. Yeah, like he was a hero, and he was my hero for sure. You know, one of the one of the greatest opportunities I had was to sew his airborne division's patch onto my bobsled uniform, and then wear that at races and so forth. And it's kind of funny. He would come visit in Park City, and I mean, I mean, he he fought in World War II. He jumped out of airplanes as a paratrooper. I asked him which was crazier, bobsled or paratrooper. I, I guess the airborne life, you know, as a paratrooper jumping into combat and he looked at me and he's just like, you're crazy. Um, <laughs> but, but it was great. Cause you know, he had moved to Florida at that point with grandma and he had no winter coats. So I let him borrow one of my Olympic jackets from the Salt Lake 2002 games. And it was one of the black ones that you generally only got if you were a sponsor, like a million dollar sponsor or more. So I told him that and he would walk around every time he put it on, he'd be like, wow, I feel like a million bucks. A little you know? special. Yeah. So we had, you know, we had a little, he, he and my grandma supported my Olympic dreams and, you know, he lived to be uh, almost 99 years old. So we had a lot of years together, a lot of time discussing World War II and what it meant, um, you know, the airborne training and to, what it was like to go overseas and, and all these different things. And one thing he told me was, you know, he hated the fact that his division was relatively unknown. And so as I kind of edged a little way, uh, edged out of the bobsled life, I, I realized, well, somebody needs to tell their story. And so I started researching that. And this was, you know, 12, 14 years ago when it really seriously began. And so I started researching their division and World War II in general. And so I've published um, three books now on, on their unit. And so you can see that's that's the last picture I have with my grandpa before he died. Um, but yeah, so so now, you know, like I said, I published three books. Um, I help run a podcast and the social media page for the Division Association. I'm their historian. And so now, you know, I spent so many years traveling, speaking about bobsled, goal setting, the Olympics and so forth. I was, you know, the center of attention. And it's cool now to get to travel all over to tell their story because they're I just going to say you get an opportunity to go be a keynote speaker and, and just different uh different opportunities to speak about this and so this is absolutely something that that you've got just a really wonderful understanding and appreciation for yeah and i'm excited to share that with everybody who comes on this tour to you yeah, know talk, talk a little about bit about because yeah well we definitely yeah we definitely gotta get on the tour and so forth so um yeah. So like I said, I've done three oh, books. The books, the so, books. Right. The books. And so, you know, anybody who comes on the tour um, will actually get a signed copy of one of these books. We'll see which one makes that happen and so forth. So, um, so I'm excited to talk about like, you know, what, what life was like for these young paratroopers that jumped on D-Day and some of the training that they went through. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing when we think about an operation as big as D-Day, like Normandy, it's almost so vast, it's hard to bring it down to the individual soldiers level, um, you know, soldiers, sailor, airmen, and so forth. And so I think on this tour, we're going to have such an oh, amazing opportunity to follow their path from the beaches, you know, into all the way to Paris and so forth. So it's just, it's going to be amazing. Um, so, yeah, so I've, I just, I've had an opportunity to meet a lot of these World War II veterans um both for the pacific theater and the european theater um a lot of the ones that i got to interview have passed on now there's so few left um but so that, that's what i love about this tour is it is a, is it a way to not just learn history but to honor these men who sacrificed so much i mean it's it's incredible to sit with, with you know in this picture i'm sitting with jim wilson who's a paratrooper um and he was telling me the story 
you know, he was, you can see his big smile on his face. But when he told me this story about when he lost his best friend, who was his radio operator, and he told me about trying to save his life and he just broke down crying, you know, I'm actually, we were at his 100th birthday in this photo and to hear these old warriors just tell these stories. And he said, I've never told anyone this story. So I'm excited on the tour to tell some of the, share some of those aspects of D-Day wow. and so forth. Okay. And this is actually another veteran that I, who just passed away. This is Vincent Speranza. Um, he just passed away recently, actually, but he was in the Battle of the Bulge and is famous for, you know, one of his buddies was, uh, was wounded and he wanted a drink. So Vincent ran into the town, found some beer, didn't have anything to put it in. So he put it in his helmet and brought it back to his friend who was wounded. So lots of stories we'll be talking about, lots of amazing things and so forth. So we'll, we'll talk about some of this other stuff when we get there, but so really with this tour, like I said, it's, it's going to be, we're going to be following the allied um, campaigns from Normandy down into Paris. So we'll start at the beaches and then we will end in Paris. So we're actually going to be flying into Paris. Um, and then we are going to um, travel up to Normandy where we're going to have a kind of a get to know each other dinner at the hotel um, to where, you know, we'll get to know, you know, me, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself on the bus ride for sure. And then at the dinner, and then also get to know each other too, because some of the people that will be coming are going to be descendants of those who fought um, in Normandy or throughout France and so forth. And that's pretty amazing when you get together with people who talk about their grandfather or even their father and share the stories that they've heard. So that's going to be a really, really cool dinner. That we're oh, yeah, I can only imagine. Um, you know what? You that's know, day one of the great is... things about yeah. groups is that you do become this tight little family and it may be your grandfather you're talking about, but pretty soon it feels like everybody's grandfather. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the amazing thing is, is, um, you know, ever since those three books came out, you know, my, my grandpa said like kind of tongue in cheek, but he said like, I'm tired of everybody knowing about D-Day, but not knowing about what we did in the Pacific theater and so forth. But since those books came out, it was kind of cool. Um, one of the officers in my grandfather's regiment, his brother actually jumped on D-Day. So I was able to, his name was Bradford Freeman, and I was able to send him a copy of one of my books saying, this is what your brother did. And then he and I talked a bit about what he did, um, what D-Day was like, what, what the jumps into Normandy were like and so forth. So more stories we'll be sharing along the way, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, but so this is day three. And we're going to be um, talking about really the British and Canadian forces on day three. Um, it, it's kind of interesting when you travel around the world and you talk about D-Day, um, it depends on where you are and that will kind of indicate what people know about it. Here in the United States, most people know about the 82nd, 101st, you know, Airborns and, and they know about Saving Private Ryan, which is, you know, a great, fantastic movie, which anybody who's it taught really so wants... many people who did not take the time to learn it properly in school but it's still just one story it is it really is and it and it, it does a, it does a great job of showing just the the viciousness of what it was like for the yeah. landings on the beaches and so forth but yeah i mean but so so day three is really cool because we get to talk about the british and canadian forces and and what they did um here in normandy you know, so so we're we're looking back in history, but if while we're on this tour, I hope we can all put ourselves in the shoes of those who are living at this time and what the D-Day invasions meant for millions of people in Europe um, that were living at that time under oppression and tyranny and cruelty with with the Nazi forces and so forth. So as we walk these beaches and as we walk where some of these battles took place, you know, that helps cement just how important they were and helps us honor the men who who performed these actions. I mean, these were young men usually. I mean, especially the paratroopers, you know, average age, 19, maybe 18, 19. Some definitely lied about their ages and were 17. So it's going to be really cool. And I'm not going to be the only historian on this tour. Like we, we are going to have local yes. historians traveling with us that are specialists in those different areas, right? Maybe you can talk to that, Wendy. 
Well, one of the things that are great about our tours is we do have the local guides and then the um, on-spot guides. So as you go from Normandy to some of the other historic sites, you'll have specialized um, tour historians who will tell specific stories, very detailed. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful that you're there and you're, you've are you got like this, this arc story that's kind of going to continue through everything. But the personalized and the very specifics um, are there for each of these sites um, that really just bring the full circle of everything that was happening. And I love that we know the Americanized story of of the of the war, but there were so many countries involved. And like you said, this this day that that's so focused around the British and the Canadians. And I think that that's also something that, you know, movies just cannot bring the whole picture to life, like being there will. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, there, there's accounts from the German forces that were up on the cliffs and, and they talked about like looking out at the ocean and just, it looked like the ocean was covered in ships. I mean, we just, we can't fathom, you know, the, the amount, I mean, this picture here does a pretty good job of showing what it was like, but, you know, uh, th there were, there were a lot of D-Day veterans, like we talked about Saving Private Ryan, that just talked about those opening scenes of trying to land and get across those beaches. And they just talked about how it was real, that that was such a great, accurate portrayal of it. You know, my grandpa, who, you know, like I said, fought in the Pacific, he, he told elementary school kids that wrote to him he'd always tell them like if you if you tell your parents if you want to know what it was like in combat go see saving private ryan we actually start here at pegasus bridge which um a lot of people don't know but this is actually one of the first um, actions for d-day the british gliders you can kind of see them in the background if you look at the truck and look above the truck you can see their gliders in the background there were three gliders that landed and the british uh, took this bridge and part of it was to prevent German reinforcements from moving in. Um, you know, that was the major concern for all the airborne forces was prevent German forces from moving to the beaches and pushing the landing forces back. But so this was um, this battle here with the British is is pretty awesome. And I think it's amazing that we get to actually go see this bridge. Um, so and and for anyone who wants to get an idea of what this battle was like um the movie the longest day does a pretty good job of actually portraying um the british forces landing and then capturing that bridge and so forth and, and keeping the german reinforcements from from moving inland and so forth um but i think it's gonna be pretty cool here we'll get to go to the um i want to say pegasus memorial but they say memorial pegasus um so that's gonna be pretty amazing to go see some artifacts um, from this from this operation here and hear some more stories. Um, I, I just think it's gonna be awesome. Yeah, so so this day is gonna be pretty amazing here. Um, we'll also tour some of the area. And then one of the great things about these tours is, um, Wendy, you and your staff do a really good job of planning their itinerary, but also mixing in free time. So it's not one of those tours where you are rushed, 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 rushed everywhere and you're exhausted by the end. It's you get to see history, walk history, experience history, go to these places. But then it's also, hey, here's some free time. So if you want to go over to that cafe or go to that museum or walk through these gift shops. And have an experience of uh, on your own. It's, it's also a wonderful time. Um, and then actually we're going to head to... Uh, We'll head to the beaches. So today we'll be focusing on Sword, Juno, and Gold Beaches. So again, this is the British, the Canadian, the Free French, and some of the Norwegian units that landed on these beaches and so forth. Yeah, I it did. You always hear about Omaha Beach, and um, yeah, I think this this picture right here is um, just how small of a portion that is compared to what the whole operation was. Yeah, and. You know, it, it's, again, it, we're American, so we focus on Omaha Beach and Point de Hoc with the Rangers and so forth, because that's where the American forces landed and then the 82nd, 101st Airborne Divisions, right? But yeah, it, it's it's amazing if you go to, you know, especially like England, um, where the focus shifts a little bit more over to Gold, Juno, and Sword Beaches, you know, and, and there were tremendous casualties taken on, on some of these beaches that, again, we, we don't fathom as much. 
I, I do love that part of Saving Private Ryan when when you, you see them walking through the cemetery, which we will actually get to walk through. I mean, that's going to be incredible to 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 walk through the Normandy Cemetery. Um, and you look at these these headstones. What amazes me is when you look at the dates, when you look at the birth date, and then you look when that soldier's gave his made the ultimate sacrifice sacrifice for freedom how young they were and some of them will just it almost breaks your heart to see how young they were i mean we're talking you know i mean high school kids yeah right? young boys, high school kids young boys. yeah and and you know and those first the first waves that landed on the beaches of course took tremendous casualties and and it wasn't really until the defenses up on the heights were were cleared away that ensuing you know, waves could move in and they landed kind of like you see here, it's it's almost like a walk on the beach, right? But one thing we have to remember is that even those who got that quote unquote walk on the beach in, in the future waves where it was safer, they were then part of those campaigns to move down and to uh, move towards Paris and then push over towards, you know, eventually into Germany and so forth. So nobody had an easy time um, who landed on those beaches. Yeah. So, so this will be this day seeing these beaches and and what there's there's I'm sure monuments and um, again the guides there to retell these stories. Yeah, yeah, and and it's yeah that's going to be fantastic to just sit with some of those local guides and just again they'll be they'll be experts at each location. So like you said, I have a broad perspective, a a, a, a deep understanding in a broad way, but they will have these these you know they'll be able to walk us to this point on on a cliff right here and tell a story about that and they'll be able to walk us down to the beach right here and talk about you know soldiers who landed in this spot i mean that's just going to be amazing that really really is um and then we'll have some free time that day as well so so moving on to day four um we're moving into to bayou which i learned how to pronounce that yesterday um i'm learning french right now so i'm working on Please. on this to get ready for the tour um so so again, on, on this day, um, we'll be looking a little bit at some of the American forces as well. And, and I'm really excited to go to this cathedral, the Bayou Cathedral. It just, it looks beautiful. I've spent a lot of time in Europe and it is always amazing to go into these cathedrals and just see the architecture and, and the sculptures and the paintings. So that's gonna be fantastic. Um, I, I definitely love that. So we'll do the cathedral we will also go over to this museum, which you can see a photo of the outside right there. Um, and then we will do a memorial. We'll, we'll go to the memorial for um, the Normandy operation. So it's it's great because every day we'll do, we'll do like a museum, we'll do some cultural things, and then we'll do some experiential things where we'll be on the beaches we or we will- experience some of France as well. Yeah, and we'll, we'll look at some of the German defenses and 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 so on and so forth. So I think that's just going to be, I don't know. I'm excited for for this day actually. Bayou looks like a, a gorgeous little town to go into. Um, you know, we're going to go back to the beaches. We'll do Omaha Beach, which is like you said, Wendy. This is where the Americans landed. So when you watch most of the American D-Day movies, it's portraying Omaha Beach and so forth. Um, but we'll all, we will also go over to Point the Hawk, which. This is just incredible from a military perspective. Um, this is where the Rangers climbed the cliffs you can see over in this right-hand picture. So wow. they climbed up the cliffs and they had to um, silence and eliminate the German guns that were here because the German guns could have fired not just on the naval landing craft, but also onto the beaches as well. So what the Rangers did here was was incredible. I actually have a, a letter that I'll share on the tour um, from one of my grandfather's friends who was one of the rangers who climbed those cliffs. And he climbed up, took part in the action up there. And then I think it was the next day or the day after um, where a German sniper hit him in the leg. So he was riding from the hospital, you know, just saying like, yeah, I climbed the cliffs and this is what we did. And now I'm in a hospital because I got shot in the leg. And, you know, he told my grandpa, like, good luck and, you know, best wishes for you. So, so it was really personal. Point to Hawk's really personal for me as well. Um, but it's just going to be amazing wow. to stand there and, and look at the view. I mean, it is, it's a gorgeous view, but it is the beach and, and the cliffs are definitely sacred ground. And to, to hear the stories of the rangers who climb these, these cliffs and what they did up there is going to be just as incredible. You know, it's going to be so great to just, 
you know, to to meet with the locals as well. And that's one of the great yeah. things about this tour Immersive. is that we'll be with the historians, but we'll also be talking with um people who live right in the area and, and, and visiting their who, shops yeah. and cafes. And mm -hmm. this is personal to them. This happened in their home. And again, if you want to, you know, uh, get a good idea of what this was like before we go, Saving Private Ryan, um, fantastic movie and, and does a really good job portraying a lot of that. Um, so, so next after the beaches and after Point to Hawk, we'll head over to the, to the American cemetery, um, which, I, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 really hard to describe what it feels like to walk through a cemetery like this. Um, you know, I've done a, I've done this in a few different places doing research, and there's a feeling there. There really is. It's 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 hallowed ground, and it's hallowed by you know these young men who made the ultimate sacrifice so that we can enjoy the freedoms we do today. Um, so we'll spend some time there, and uh, just a lot of time to think. I think this is a this is a sacred ground. It really is. But you look at what the Allies did in Normandy, and it wasn't to conquer, it was to free. And so walking in these cemeteries just shows the price of that freedom. And it's something that we shouldn't forget. And it's something that I think we'll all take home and carry with us for the rest of our lives. So so after that, we will, um, we're, we're gonna move on. Um, so so day five, we're gonna hit Utah Beach and San Marigli. And, and I love this photo because it, it shows the defenses that the landing um, craft had to go through themselves and then the beach defenses that all those landing on the beaches had to go through. I mean, you can look out in the water and you can see those iron, um, they look like pyramids almost. Those were designed yeah, to rip the, open the, the landing craft and then sometimes they had mines attached to them. Um, and then some areas in the beaches were mined. And then you have all this barbed wire, which is designed to stop troops on foot so that the German machine guns and mortars and artillery can kill them while they're trying to break through those barriers. And, and, and the ingenuity of the landing forces getting through these defenses is a story we'll talk about on the beaches themselves, but it just shows, you know, I was reading the story of one of the troopers who, who made that dash across the beach and he talked about, you know, the landing ramp comes down and you see the explosions in the water. You can hear the machine gun, um, machine guns going off you can hear the bullets pinging off the armor and you know you got to run out there so you step off and you're stepping into the water and your boots fill with sand and water and then you're trying to run across wet sand and then dry sand carrying all your equipment while being shot at hoping you don't step on a landmine and you're trying to make it over you can see this photo right here those sea walls a little bit of of defensive safety if you want but eventually you had to make the decision to climb up and over and and move up. So bravery was common on these Normandy beaches. So that's going to yeah. be just amazing Not to look at these things. Not a word that is taken lightly for sure. No, no. And and so in Utah Beach, we'll we'll talk about the 101st Airborne Division and and their drops in the area and what their mission was and so forth. Um, you know, it's it's they were really tasked with capturing roadways and bridges so the German reinforcements couldn't move in, but also then all the allied um, forces landing could move inland and so forth. Um, you know, but when you look at the, the 101st Airborne Division, usually airborne divisions were a little bit lighter than an infantry division, manpower wise, but they took 1500 casualties um, there in Normandy. So it just shows you the Screaming Eagles, you know, uh, if, you say, if you've seen the miniseries um, Band of Brothers, um, they do a really good job in those first couple episodes of portraying what happened here in Normandy and so forth. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about the 101st. And then this is this is fantastic. I can't wait to go to San Marigli. This is gonna be um, just, we'll, we'll talk about the 82nd Airborne Division, their drops, their missions, some of their operations. And again, it's gonna be great with the local historians to hear some of those personal stories and then walk to those spots and you know talk about different actions at these different places and so forth but to go over to um to the airborne museum here in 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 town is going to be i'm really excited for this it, it it just everything i've heard about it and everything i've seen from it makes it look like it's going to be a fantastic experience as, as well so um that's that's going to be awesome but this is a fantastic experience to come walk where your dad or grandfather or great grandfather landed or um, where he was on the ship off this coast or where he flew over. 
in one of the bombers or fighters and so forth. So it takes it from, I don't know much about it to for the rest of your life, being able to remember, I walked where they walked and I, I stood where they stood and, and it just, Changes that's you. powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. It really is. So, so day six here, we're going to go into the, uh, the Cotentin Peninsula. Um, really Cherbourg was uh, the, the major objective because Cherbourg has a, a deep water port. It's actually the second largest artificial, has the second largest artificial harbor in the world. So the allies needed a deep water port to be able to move all their supplies inland. So once, you know, once the landings happened in Normandy and so forth, then it's like, okay, now we need to take Cherbourg so we can start moving our supplies in because they eventually had to get to Germany. I mean, that's the whole goal is to push the Nazis back into Germany and end this war. So, so today we talk about something that's, you know, pretty amazing. The, the Cherbourg, um, Cherbourg itself is, it's a beautiful um, town. Like it's gonna be so much fun to see, but the, the reason the allies were able to keep moving forward, keep pushing inland, and then you eventually get to like the Battle of the Bulge and, and all these things, was what was called the Red Bull Red Ball Express, um, which you can see a good picture of right here. It's just the trucks that they're landing the supplies in Cherbourg and then driving them inland. And you know, at its height, at any given time on the Red Ball Express, there were 900 vehicles on the road, um, and they would move 12,000 tons of supplies a day, which is something we don't really think about very much. You don't see that in the movies because it's not it's bloody, not glamorous. It's not sexy. Yeah. yeah, it's not glamorous at all, but it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, these truck drivers would drive, you know, they'd, they'd have two in the truck and they would take turns driving and, you know, they would do 54 hour, you know, drives and so forth, just taking turns through this whole thing. So um, uh, my, I, I found that they had moved more than 412,000 tons of supplies um, to 28 different divisions that were moving uh, and fighting in, in Europe and stuff like that. So we will talk about the Red Ball Express and just how important that was. But yeah, so we'll talk about Red Ball Express. We're going to, um, we'll get to visit Cherbourg, which I don't know, I mean, like up up on the, the picture on the left, you can see at the top there, it's Fort Durel. Um, so we're gonna go up there, we're gonna tour that. We're gonna go through the, uh, the memorial that's up there. But from up there, the view just looks incredible. And Cherbourg itself is, you know, it just looks like this, beautiful yeah. little French town yeah. we're going to get to go into, which I'm excited to go walk through and, you know, find a nice little cafe. And, and I'm not going to lie. I am probably going to eat way too many street crepes <laughs> on this tour. As Cause there's nothing should. like, yeah. as I should, but there's nothing like walking through France and getting a street crepe just right off, yeah. you know, from the vendor right there, right off the little stove. So anyway, so yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll tour the fort, we'll go through the museum and then we will have free time in Cherbourg as well. So there's a lot of things to see here. Um, there's a, uh, uh, I think they believe, I think they call it the Cite del Mar. Not sure I'm saying that right, but it's pretty cool. It has uh, an aquarium. It has a Titanic exhibit. It has a museum, has some art, and I think it has some shops. So it's just like this central place that you can go tour and go through. And, and everyone who's gone there says that's just a great experience. So, so day seven, this, this is getting into, um, Basically, it's just called the Battle of the Hedgerows, which was uh, God, this next. This picture shows it right here. So the hedgerows were there is the they call it the bokage as well, but it's these thick. Um, you can kind of see it a little bit in the picture on the right. There were these mounds that grew up with the the vegetation, so the trees, and and they just over the years they got so thick. And basically, they were like boundary lines, and then also kind of pastures for the locals, you know, um, horses and, and so on and so forth. Right. But the Germans knew they, they had, they knew that the allies were coming in. And so the, the hedgerow area, the bokage areas, it, it, it was quite large. I I'll have to get a map together for maybe our pre-departure meeting, but the allies had to push through these one by one. And you can see in this quote here, that at this rate, we are going, this blessed war could last 10 years. They just took forever to take each hedgerow because basically what would happen is like you can see in this picture on the left you would get up to one of the mounds you'd have to peek over see what's going on the germans would hide in their machine guns with their machine guns and mortars in the corners or back in the vegetation on the other side so you couldn't see it so a soldier would have to make the decision of like you know 
charge yeah, across. And once you started, you couldn't really stop and go back because you're out in the open. And then the tanks, this vegetation was so thick in a lot of places that the tanks couldn't even push through. Or when they went up over the mounds, well, their soft belly is exposed and the Germans would hit the tanks. So the tanks are getting knocked out and so forth. So it was just this, um, basically the Allies plan D-Day, the Normandy invasions, fantastic, down to the minute details. Nobody really thought about what was going to happen once we reached the hedgerows. I mean, that's an oversimplification, but we'll talk about all the problems that happened here. I mean, it's beautiful country. It is gorgeous country, and it's going to be breathtaking to tour around here. Um, but it really was ingenuity. It, it was individual courage, you know, from the individual soldier, squads, platoons, companies, so forth. You know, you know you'd have a squad that would have to take this hedgerow section and it just so you think of all those battles going on um over the time it took to take the hedgerow country and and i and i learned this one of the interesting things was so this tank right here it's really hard to see but if you look at the front right by the treads in the front there's these metal teeth looking things yeah so like this is called factor. a hedgerow cutter. yeah so what they did was they actually took those metal pyramids that i showed you on the beaches of Utah Beach, they took those, cut them up, and then welded them to the front of tanks. So they used the German ingenuity. Ingenuity. The Americans, I mean, that's one thing World War II is full of ingenuity. A lot of the things we have today are because of ingenuity in World War II. So we'll get to talk about these tanks and all the different ways that um, they yeah. just cleared the hedgerows and so forth. So then we'll move on to, to St. Lowe. And um, this is going to be pretty. I don't know, St. Lowe is going to be just a great little town to go visit. Like I, like I said, the, the videos and the photos and everybody I've talked to who's been there says they love it. It's just everyone there is friendly and it's nice. Um, so we'll get to go to the Memorial Museum. And then we will also go over to um, the Thomas um, Howie Memorial. Um, he was... There's a famous story of, of the Lost Battalion. So it's the 1st Battalion of the 116th Infantry Regiment. Everybody's moving towards um, St. Lo, and the 1st Battalion got in front and got isolated, so they became the Lost Battalion. And Major Howie's 3rd Battalion moved in um, to find them and kind of rescue them and so forth. But he was actually killed um, by mortar fire. So he was in an ambulance. His body was in an ambulance and there were so many other casualties that they said we need the space so they took major howie's body out and very carefully placed it in some rubble just just for the time being they covered it with an american flag um and the ambulance got the living wounded um back to kind of a, a, a field hospital and so forth and so major howie's men took his body and put it on the front of a jeep and when they moved into st Lowe, he was actually the first American into St. Lowe because he was in the first Jeep and his body was the first to cross over and so forth. So we'll get to go over to, to his memorial there after we do the museum, um, which is, uh, it, again, it's another, another one of those sacred spots and it just, it personalizes the battle. It's for the another Hedgerows personal so story, another American monument in this yeah. area. Yeah. So these museums, all these museums we're going to go to are are amazing. They're full of artifacts, full of photographs, um, full of very passionate volunteers and museum staff who are experts at these different battle sites and so forth. But to just sit and talk to them, just to hear their stories, it, it it's it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing to walk the grounds and then hear them talk about these things. And when we get to Major Howie's Memorial, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Our local historian will share some more things as well, as well as St. Lowe itself. Now, now St. Lowe, it, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to look like it did um, during World War II. And the reason for that is this is a picture of St. Lowe. It was 95% destroyed by aerial bombings. So when we go, we'll see the rebuilt St. Lowe, which started in like really the 50s and 60s and so forth. So we'll see the modern St. Lowe, but but it's still a beautiful town and it's going to be great to just meet with the people and walk the streets and again, find a great little cafe. Yeah. So then we'll move on to day eight. This is the filet pocket, which it's, it's kind of overlooked a lot. Um, like you said, it's not the glamorous sort of thing, but basically what happened was, you know, as the allies pushed in, um, they kind of created this pocket around German forces. Um, and, and it was, it was um, the, the German army group B really, 
Um, so this was 55 days of fighting. And it's really, really was um, Operation Cobra is what it's called. So um, we'll just, we'll, we'll kind of follow, we'll tour a couple of the different engagement sites um, that the allies were, were fighting in to reduce this pocket and push the Germans further back towards Germany, right? They're trying to end this war. Um, you know, the goal was to end it, you know, in Christmas of, you know, 43, but here we are in 1944 and June and July and, you know, still pushing the Germans back and so forth. Um, this is now into August of 44. Um, so the pocket, the fillet pocket is that bulge of the German forces and so forth. And it's also sometimes known as the fillet gap because uh, there were a lot of Germans who were able to escape through a gap in the pocket. So you will hear, you will hear the battle of fillet, the fillet pocket and the fillet gap, both are used to describe this and so forth. Um, so we're going to tour this area and tour the town. I mean, just look at that town. Like it's beautiful. Like that's the thing is we're going to such historic battle sites, but going to these beautiful towns and I, that's going to be so. That. Yeah. 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 And we're going to end up at, at Mont Ormel um, or I've, I've heard Mont Ormel, you know, the American version. Um, this is, it's, it's a little bit of a hilltop that was in the Falais pocket. And a lot of the escaping German forces um, pushed towards this hill. And um, just on top of the hill, there were uh, just only a few hundred, I believe, I want to say it was Norwegian. I'm probably getting that wrong. Um, but just a few allied soldiers, we'll just put that way, and standing in the way. And they actually stood their ground um, against a lot of these retreating Germans. So we'll go up to Mont Ormel, talk about that. And then we'll go to the memorial that's there um, and, and discuss a little bit of the area, a little bit of the battle that's going on. And then again, we'll have some free time and so forth. If you haven't felt exhausted by the, the weight of history on this tour and culture and just been thrilled by the stories and meeting with all the locals and so forth, if that hasn't happened yet, well, it's probably going to happen in Paris. You know, the City of Lights, you know, it, it was... You know, I, 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 there's this historic photo right here, all the Allied soldiers uh, marching through the Arc de Triomphe. And, and uh, you know, after Paris was liberated, you know, going to Paris on a, on a weekend pass was, that was the highlight of, of so many soldiers in the ETO and they just loved going there. And so really today we get, um, I, I'm excited for this. I've been to Paris and it is just a fantastic city. So much to see, so much to do. Um, so we're going to do a half day city tour and we'll get to see, um, the Eiffel tower, Notre Dame, um, you know, which is going to be fantastic and heartbreaking at the same time. Because I was going to say, see about... what's being, how the rebuild is going. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's just this iconic landmark, beautiful history. So it'll be so cool to see, but heartbreaking as well and we'll you know to see the rebuild that's going on i know they're doing a really good job of trying to you know make it safer yeah, and stronger yeah. but also keep the original look and feel and so forth um so like we'll have that everything from that right right so we'll see all these places we're also going to do a river cruise which i've never done that in paris before so this is going to be pretty incredible to go down the Seine I river and by the river yes yeah, I mean, it's it, it's being able to stand back and just enjoy all the scenery, you know, the shops here, the cathedral here, you know, that the, the even the apartment buildings, even the housing looks, you know, amazing along the river and so forth. So we'll we'll definitely have some free time in Paris, but it's going to be full of a lot of sightseeing um, on our city tour and then also on our river cruise as well. And then if I remember, if memory serves, we'll have our farewell dinner um that night which is bittersweet um we get to share our, our final meals together and just share those memories and just trade contact information because like you said you'll make friends on this tour to last the rest of your lives you'll you'll stay friends and stay connected and exchange christmas cards and you know email messages and so forth throughout the year just you bond over a tour like this which is pretty awesome well, everybody is going to grow. I think this this tour, one of the things I really like about it is it's not too long. You have several days 
where you are learning a lot, you're seeing a lot, you're feeling a lot, and it does get heavy. It does give you the free time so you can absorb it, um, personalize it, um, celebrate the, you know, the the people um, and the victories, you know, and, and what it means to each person. It's at a beautiful time of the year to go and you're going to see so many people there on this um, anniversary year in, with your own special group um, getting to have this experience. So it is just right. But I think I one think thing structured to point, very nicely. It is. I mean, this the itinerary is laid out fantastically. Like you said, it's a good mixture of history and and war always has a weight to it. And it should. I mean, it really, really should. There, there's no easy way around that. And to be able to walk these grounds, like we've talked about, sacred grounds, to learn the history, it's going to be amazing and fantastic. Um, so we'll have that weight. Well, it'll be offset with the the culture, the local people, um, the experiences we'll have going into, like I said, their shops. And and, and, and I can't remember, um, if I remember right, it's when we go to Pegasus Bridge, um, we're going to have lunch that day in the cafe that is in the house that was the first official official liberated house on D-Day. So we're going to go have lunch there together in that cafe. But the family that owned the house on D-Day, it's it's their the daughter who is five years old still runs the cafe. So we'll be talking about war and have that wait, but then we'll be able to sit down with the local people and hear their stories and share them. a meal with them and laughs and and just, you know, take pictures together. So there is a good offset. And like you said, like to end in Paris, you know, Hitler wanted Paris destroyed. Like he ordered, he said, if the allies are coming in, destroy the city. And, you know, so a lot of people don't know that, especially, you know, even when they go to Paris nowadays, they don't know that all that we're enjoying and seeing almost didn't exist could have, could have been taken right away right right but it does because of what happened and all these other battles and so forth that we're following the freedoms we have now um are because of them it, it it's pretty amazing to sit down over lunch and hear those stories and that's what we're going to be oh, having yeah. on this trip mm -hmm. now yeah I mean, here's an interesting question um sure. so this is the last day of Wright's home and yeah. what's nice, I will add, is Paris does have the nonstop flight back into Salt Lake. So um, that it's is definitely <laughs> a um, something to, to strive to, to try to do because, you know, flying internationally has not been all that fun the last couple of years. But, you know, yeah. something great to celebrate. I'm kind of curious, um, like, what is your hopes of the type of people who will join you on this tour? You know, it's going to be a mixture. You're going to have some hardcore military enthusiasts, I'm sure. Um, you talked about, you know, we're going on the 80th anniversary of D-Day. But the great thing is we're going uh, the month before, right? June will be the actual 80th anniversary, but we're going before. So the reason for that is we're kind of hoping to avoid the crazy crowds that will be going on in June. We will miss some of the celebrations, but we will get the others and we will get all the full experiences and so forth. So like I said, we'll have some really hardcore military enthusiasts and, and that's fantastic. I'm excited for that because they will know a lot of things that I won't know. They'll know things that even the local historians won't know because you can't be a specialist in everything. So that's gonna be great. But then you'll also have descendants of soldiers and sailors and airmen from D-Day. You'll have kids and grandkids who will be coming and talking about, yeah, my my grandfather was on this ship um, just offshore and they were firing in support of this division coming in and so forth. So that's going to be wonderful. And then you'll just you know, we'll have general travelers who love yeah. to travel and want to experience France and want to see this different side of it, you know, um, I mean, you know, you've been in travel for a long time. It's really I was going to say, I think wanna... just, yeah, just history people in mm -hmm. general, I think. Yeah. But the, the people who've called, you know, they're, they've seen enough movies that they're, they're ready to experience in person. They love the history. Um, they, they're not personally connected to it, but they want to be. And I think we all have a connection to this, whether it's through our family line or just being an American. And, and what it means to to be an American and and have 
partake in, you know, um, uh, what we've benefited from this. So, yeah, there, you know, there it's, is a it's, lot to learn. Yeah, history. to have those experiences, it, it changes things. Like, again, I, you know, I'd heard stories from my grandfather and some of his buddies and read a lot of books and seen plenty of movies and documentaries. But I'll give an example of what this experience is like. I went down to Tacoa, Georgia, and Camp Tacoa was where the 506 Band of Brothers formed, right? If you've seen Band of Brothers, the first episode really is at that camp. They they talk about running up and down Mount Curahy, which I've done. And it really brings it home. And then, you know, to, to read these stories and these letters of these paratroopers or talk to those who survived. But then they'll talk about what it was like to get on those ships to sail overseas to to head to the European theater. So 506 obviously headed to England first and so forth. But to hear them say something like, we wondered as we got on the ship who was not coming back, right? And these are young kids. I mean, we're yeah. talking again, just out of high school. That's and the reality. That is the reality of it. And it really brings it home. So when you talk about getting greater respect for this, just as Americans in general, um, but I mean, of course, we'd love to have travelers from you know other countries if they want to come join us. Please join us, absolutely. I um, just it it really is just a, a neat opportunity, and we've taken a lot of your time. I've appreciated you sharing <laughs> so much of your expertise and knowledge about these different battles and and what people mm -hmm. can can be excited to hear. And and you've kind of teased a little bit of the different things that you'll be sharing throughout the tour and the different experiences. Right. Um, we just really hope that this will this will be something that um, people will be able to connect with and that it's a wonderful opportunity to be part of this historical um, anniversary. Think about yeah. what we're going to see and what we're going to experience together. It is it is something you'll look back on for the rest of your lives. And and again, it's one thing it to see the movies. You. Yeah, for sure. It will. And it's one thing like one thing to see the movies, one thing to read the documentaries or read books, whatever. But to walk there, it changes things. History comes alive. So this lighter right here, you know, I've I've you know, I've lectured all over the United States. Um, and and I show this lighter and I say, you know, it's it's just a lighter, right? And you know, no big deal. But then I talk about how this lighter was in World War II. That this lighter actually has carved on it um Leyte, Luzon, New Guinea, Philippines, Japan. So a soldier carried this through all those days all of those. combat. Wow. Right. And and so it it changes the lighter. Does that make sense? In the beginning it was just a lighter, but now knowing all that about it changes. And that's what this tour will do for everyone who comes. It won't just be D-Day. It won't just be Normandy, France yeah. or St. Lowe and so forth. It will become real and it will become a part of you. So history will really come alive, which that's powerful. So I'm yeah. really excited for people to come with us. And, you know, I know that if anybody has any questions who's watching this, um, you know, we'll, we'll post the link below to the tour information. And, and like Wendy said, Sarah, the, the tour manager, fantastic. If you have any questions, please email her or call her and she'd be happy to help you out because um, we'd love to have you join us. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, even if you're unable to join us in 24 on this tour, we hope that um, some of the information that you saw on this uh webinar about the different battles and about these different places um, is something that maybe helps with your general understanding and appreciation and um, respect for for the, the the men and women who were over there uh, serving and, and liberating. And, and we're just, again, we're just grateful to be part of this um, experience and we're thankful for Jeremy and we're really excited for anybody who'll plan on joining us next year. So um, our website is MME for Morris Murdoch, E for Escorted Tours with an S dot com. Come take a look at the tour and we hope to hear from you again. Jeremy, thank you. I'm excited for you and for everybody who's going to get to have this experience. Thanks, Wendy. I appreciate it.